We're doing it. We're doing it live. We're doing it. We're doing. Oh, we're live. <clears throat> um, I think that uh, my dear friend Greg just had to reboot. Um, if you're watching this later, uh, man, you are a keener. Uh, this is the pre-game pre-game show for uh, debate night. We're going to be airing Obama's uh, speech in full, so we can watch it as a community, uh, as well as listening to uh, an interview with uh, uh, with Biden from uh, Brene Brown that just completely blows my mind. This is worth watching. It's not the debate. It's worth watching, um, even if it is later. Uh, if you need a, a, a pick-me-up or to further understand uh, why we are separating into the teams that we're separating into, or it seems to. Uh, Greg is back. Oh. Everything is awesome. Yeah, once in a while when I do the reset thing, it completely reboots my computer for no apparent reason. I mean, sometimes it just it just needs what it needs. Yeah. So, so what do you think about... Why? It's not candy. It's self-care. That's my... Oh. See, I'm going to... Okay, when we... <laughs> <laughs> also... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Yellow. Um, I'm probably not going to need any of that for this first hour or so. The hour and a half, right? Hour so and a half. Here's, what I, here's what I was thinking. And initially, I was thinking we do the Biden thing first, then we do Obama, and then we do the thing. But now what I'm thinking is we do Obama first um, because there ha- there is no better representation of Biden that I have heard anywhere other than that podcast. So we're not um, live yet. We are live right now. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Right okay. Okay, Corey. Uh, yeah. We, you want to do the thing? I I don't know. I just I I thought I got here late. Uh, uh you did not. No, I'll totally do it. Uh, Corey just said I joined. Uh, what was the thing about teams? I'll be on sporadically, and then in an hour, I'll probably be on to stay. Uh, Corey, the podcast episode we're going to air live with uh, Brene Brown and uh, Biden. Um. She goes into the kinds of power that that there are, uh, and it perfectly describes the horrors of the Trump administration. And she was doing this study on k- kinds of power and the ramifications of those kinds of power uh, years ago. Uh, so, and she actually has to make the caveat: I'm not just making a list of things that the Trump administration is. Right. right. And anybody this- that's worked in power and control dynamics will tell you they recognize all of these behaviors right and, from and, their and, work exactly so yeah. I, I and it was Kelly Smith of course that brought uh, uh, that podcast to our attention and I, I spent the whole time just like ranting and yelling in our uh, chat thread about how amazing it was and how our whole family needs to experience it so we wanted to do that in the pregame today uh, and it really it, it it shows you why we're separating into the teams that we're separating into and you can spot a Trump supporter a mile away they all look like an abusive boyfriend um, to some degree or another, which is uh, not good. So feel free to share this out. So again, we're going to do an hour and a half of uh, uh, some uh, some stuff we really, really want to share with you guys. Make sure we all watch uh, and experience and listen to as a community. Uh, and then we'll take a little break. We'll restart the stream and then go into uh, into debate mode. Right. So yeah, catching up. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, a, a special pregame edition of uh, Coffee. Hashtag Coffee on the Solo Local Live Network. Donna, uh, Anna has subscribed to So Local, pa- so Local Live Network, so she will get a notification tonight. But she's also working till 9 o'clock uh, her time, so don't expect her to show up anytime soon. Just making sure. Uh, yeah, so th- th- I did not listen to the Joe Biden, Brene Brown piece. I haven't listened oh, to that yet. I-, I can't wait to get your reactions in real time. But Do I'm you super wanna... stoked about about the Obama thing because we've been asking him to take the gloves off and go after Trump directly for I don't know three and a half years, and he finally did. So yeah, no, I mean her her alt account uh, there, Donna. I got I got this. Anna's taken care of. We got this. <laughs> uh, Anna's our friend that just moved to, moved to Michigan from here in West Pasco, so she's uh, uh, feeling I, I don't know maybe homesick's not the right word, but she misses all of us. And uh, she wanted to join us tonight for that. Yes, 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 yes. Hi, Rika. Nice to see you tonight. Uh, hi, Lori Bersani. Hope you get rid of the, the the dreaded invasive Cuban tree frogs very soon. See, I'm having conversations with all these people, Corey, uh, throughout the day, <laughs> all through the week now. So, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's so this, so yeah. Just so for those that are arriving late, that's the plan. We're gonna air. The, the Obama speech from Philadelphia yesterday in its entirety, and it's great and uh, and 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 funny and wonderful because he is. And then uh, this the Brene Brown 
uh, podcast on power with an interview with Joe Biden, which is also great. So, so it, yeah, I almost want to play. Okay. Stop during that, but we might I, run out of time. Yeah. So let, let, we'll just have to see how it goes. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Cause yeah, getting, getting your hot takes all the way through that, I think would be <laughs> really well, fun. I, I expect though that we're going to be muting quite a bit through this just to let it roll and uh, and we're going to enjoy it with you. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I think that's the plan. Yeah, I haven't listened to this entire thing in its entirety either. So uh, so let's rock and roll. And All right. Thank you guys it. for joining us. Obviously, get the shares out. Let everybody know what's happening. And uh, you know, we get to for a second remember what it was like to have a president that didn't suck balls. Yeah, it's, it's important to remember that he did this speech to a bunch of people sitting in their cars. Yeah. So all the horn honking is actually like applause, not disruption. Horn honking. Philadelphia! Man, it is good to be back in Pennsylvania. Sigh. What beautiful weather we got here, a little Indian summer. You know, I know... Uh, the president spent some time in Erie last night, and uh, apparently he complained about having to travel here. Then he cut the event short, poor guy. I, I don't feel that way. I love coming to Pennsylvania. You guys delivered for me twice, and I am back here tonight to ask you to deliver the White House for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I want to thank Mr. Philadelphia, Charlie Mack, his daughter, India Marie. What an outstanding young lady she was. I, th those of you who are fathers and have daughters, you know how that feels when, when, when you see your daughters just shining. I know a little bit about that. Uh, and it was great to see Representatives Brendan Boyle, Mary Gay Scanlon, Governor Tom Wolf. Attorney General Josh Shapiro, Mayor Jim Kenney. Philadelphia, we got 13 days. That's our lucky number right here. 13 days until the most important election of our lifetimes. And you don't have to you don't have to wait for November 3rd to cast your ballot. You've got two ways to vote right now. Number one, you can vote early in person through next Tuesday. How many people, anybody here voted early already? Just, if you haven't, just go to IWillVote.com slash PA and find out where you can vote early. Number two, you can vote from home with a mail-in ballot. Just go to IWillVote.com slash PA to request your ballot right away. And before you send it back, Pennsylvania's got this thing where you've got to use both envelopes. So you've got to read the directions carefully to make sure your vote counts. And if you've already voted, then you've got to help your friends and family make a plan to vote. Take them with you if you vote early or if you vote in person on election day, because this election requires every single one of us to do our part. And what we do these next 13 days will matter for decades to come. Now, last time I was in Philadelphia, I was at the Constitution Center. And I was delivering a speech for the Democratic National Convention this year. And I said during that speech, I've sat in the Oval Office with both of the men who are running for president. And they are very different people. I explained that I never thought Donald Trump would embrace my vision or continue my policies. But I did hope, for the sake of the country, that he might show some interest in taking the job seriously. But it hasn't happened. He hasn't shown any interest in doing the work or helping anybody but himself and his friends or treating the presidency like a reality show that he can use to get attention. 
And by the way, even then, his TV ratings are, are down. So you know that upsets him. But the thing is, this is not a reality show. This is reality. And the rest of us have had to live with the consequences of him proving himself incapable of taking the job seriously. At least 220,000 Americans have died. More than 100,000 small businesses have closed. Millions of jobs are gone. Our proud reputation around the world is in tatters. Presidents up for re-election usually ask if the country is better off than it was four years ago. I'll tell you one thing. Four years ago, you'd be tailgating here at the link instead of watching a speech from your cars. The only people truly better off than they were four years ago are the billionaires who got his tax cuts. Right now, as we speak, Trump won't even extend relief to the millions of families who are having trouble paying the rent or putting food on the table because of this pandemic. But he's been doing all right by himself. As it turns out, this was just reported in the last 48 hours. We know that he continues to do business with China because he's got a secret Chinese bank account. How is that possible? How this is, is the best. Possible? A secret Chinese bank account. Listen, can you imagine if I had had a secret Chinese bank account? When I was once for real? <laughs> You think, you think my, you think Fox News might have been a little concerned about that? They would have called me Beijing Barry. <laughs> it is not a great idea to have a president who owes a bunch of money to people overseas. That's that's not a good idea. I mean, of the taxes Donald Trump pays. He may be sending more to foreign governments than he pays in the United States. Not may, he is. He only paid $750 in federal income tax. Listen, my first job was at a Baskin Robbins when I was 15 years old. I think I might have paid more taxes that year working at a dispensing ice cream. How, how is that possible? How, how, how many people here paid less than that? It's possible, just possible now, that if, if, if you are living high on the hog and you only pay $750 in taxes, that maybe, just maybe, he might not know what working people are going through here in Pennsylvania. We cannot afford four more years of this, Philadelphia. But the good news is, right now you can choose change. Right now you can vote for my friend Joe Biden and his running mate Kamala Harris as the next president and vice president of the United States of America. Now, Joe, Joe's no stranger to here. He, he's a native son. Scrappy kid from Scranton. You know him. And you know he knows you. But let me, let me tell you how I came to know him and, and, and how I came to love him. Twelve years ago, when I chose, when I chose Joe Biden as vice president, uh, as, as my vice presidential running mate, I didn't know Joe all that well. We had served in the Senate together, but we weren't super close. He and I came from different places. We came from different generations. But I came to admire Joe as a man who has learned early on to treat everybody he meets with dignity and respect. Living by the words his parents taught him, no one's better than you, Joe, but you're better than nobody. And that empathy, that decency, 
That belief that everybody counts, that's who Joe is. That's who he'll be. And I can tell you the presidency doesn't change who you are. It reveals who you are. And Joe has shown himself to be a friend of working people. For eight years, Joe was the last one in the room when I faced a big decision. He made me a better president. And he's got the character and experience to make us a better country. And he and Kamala are going to be in the fight, not for themselves, but for every single one of us. Look, I get that this president wants full credit for the economy he inherited and zero blame for the pandemic that he ignored. But you know what? The job doesn't work that way. Tweeting at the television doesn't fix things. Making stuff up doesn't make people's lives better. You've got to have a plan. You've got to put in the work. And along with the experience to get things done, Joe Biden has concrete plans and policies that will turn our vision of a better, fairer, stronger country into a reality. We literally left this White House a pandemic playbook that would have shown them how to respond before the virus reached our shores. They probably used it to, I don't know, prop up a wobbly table somewhere. We don't know where that playbook went. Eight months into this pandemic, cases are rising again across this country. Donald Trump isn't suddenly gonna protect all of us. He can't even take the basic steps to protect himself. Just last night, he complained up in Erie that the pandemic made him go back to work. I'm quoting here. He was, he was upset that the pandemic's made him go back to work. If he'd actually been working the whole time, it never would have gotten this bad. So look, he, he, here's the truth. I, I want to be honest here. This pandemic would have been challenging for any president. But this idea that somehow this White House has done anything but completely screw this up is just not true. I'll give you a, a very specific example. Korea identified its first case at the same time that the United States did. At the same time, their per capita death toll is just 1.3% of what ours is. In Canada, it's just... 39% of what ours is. Other countries are still struggling with the pandemic, but they're not doing as bad as we are because they've got a government that's actually been paying attention. And that means lives lost. And that means an economy that doesn't work. And just yesterday, when asked if he'd do anything differently, Trump said, not much. Really? Not much? Nothing you can think of that could have helped some people keep their loved ones alive. So Joe's not going to screw up testing. He's not going to call scientists idiots. He's not going to host a super spreader event at the White House. Joe will get this pandemic under control with a plan to make testing free and widely available. To get a vaccine to every American cost free and to make sure our frontline heroes never to ask other countries for the equipment they need. His plan will guarantee paid sick leave for workers and parents affected by the pandemic and make sure that the small businesses that hold our communities together and employ millions of Americans can reopen safely. You know, Donald, Donald Trump likes to claim he built this economy. But America created 1.5 million more jobs in the last three years of the Obama-Biden administration than in the first three years of the Trump-Pence administration. How you figure that? And that was before he could blame the pandemic. Now, 
He did inherit the longest streak of job growth in American history. But just like everything else he inherited, he messed it up. The economic damage he inflicted by botching the pandemic response means he will be the first president since Herbert Hoover to actually lose jobs. Joe's got a plan to create 10 million good, clean energy jobs as part of a historic $2 trillion investment to fight climate change, to secure environmental justice. And he'll pay, he'll pay for it by rolling back that tax cut for billionaires. And Joe sees this moment not just as a chance to get back to where we were, but to finally make long overdue changes so that our economy actually makes life a little easier for everybody. The waitress trying to raise her kid on her own. The student trying to figure out how to pay for next semester's classes. The shift worker who's always on the edge of getting laid off. The cancer survivor who's worried about her pre-existing conditions protections being taken away. Let me tell you something, Pennsylvania. This I know to be true. Joe and Kamala will protect your health care and expand Medicare and make insurance more affordable for everybody. You know, re Republicans love to say right before an election that they'll protect your pre-existing conditions. Now, Joe and I actually protected your policies to make sure people with pre-existing conditions could get health insurance and have coverage. We did it through something called the Affordable Care Act, <laughs> a.k.a. Obamacare. And Republicans tried to repeal or undermine it more than 60 times. And when they've been asked about it, they, be, they keep on promising, we're going to have a great replacement. They said, it's coming. It's been coming in two weeks for the last 10 years. Where is it? Where, where is this great plan to replace Obamacare? They've had 10 years to do it. There is no plan. They've never had one. Instead, they've attacked the Affordable Care Act at every turn, driving up costs, driving up the uninsured. Now they're trying to dismantle your care in the Supreme Court as we speak as quickly as they can in the middle of a pandemic with nothing but empty promises to take its place. It's shameful. The idea that you would take health care away from people at the very moment where people need it most, what is the logic of that? There is no logic. Joe knows that a first, the first job of a president is to keep us safe from all threats, foreign, domestic, or microscopic. When the daily intelligence briefings flash warning signs about a virus, a president can't ignore him. He can't be AWOL. Just like when Russia puts bounties on the heads of our soldiers in Afghanistan, the commander-in-chief can't be missing in action. I, I can tell you this. Joe Biden would never call the men and women of our military suckers or losers. Who does that? He knows these, these heroes are, are somebody's children, somebody's spouse, somebody's dad or mom. He understands that. And he's going to restore our standing in the world because he knows that America's true strength comes from setting an example that the world wants to follow. A nation that stands with democracy, not dictators. A nation that can mobilize and inspire others to overcome threats like climate change and terrorism and, and poverty and disease. And with Joe and Kamala at the helm, you're not going to have to think about the crazy things they said every day. And that's worth a lot. You're not going to have to argue about them every day. It just won't be so exhausting. You, you might be able to have a Thanksgiving dinner without having an argument. 
You'll be able to go about your lives knowing that the president is not going to retweet conspiracy theories about secret cabals running the world or, or that Navy SEALs didn't actually kill bin Laden. Think about that. The president of the United States retweeted that. Imagine. What? What? <laughs> We're not going to have a president oh. that goes out of his way. He almost made you spit out your beverage, didn't he? Doesn't support him. <laughs> Literally, yes. Or, or, or threaten them <laughs> with jail. That's not what? normal presidential behavior. We wouldn't tolerate it from a high school principal. We wouldn't tolerate it from a, a coach. We wouldn't tolerate it from a co-worker. We, we wouldn't tolerate it in our own family, except for maybe crazy uncle somewhere, you know. He, yeah, he's, 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 I mean, we, why would we expect and ex accept this from the president of the United States? And how, why are folks making excuses for that? Oh, well, that's just, that's just him. No, it's, no. There are consequences to these actions. They embolden other people to be cruel and divisive and racist. And it frays the fabric of our society. And it affects how our children see things. And it affects the ways that our families get along. It affects how the world looks at America. That behavior matters. Character matters. And by the way, while he's doing all that, it distracts all of us from the truly destructive actions that his appointees are doing all across the government, actions that affect your lives. You know, the Environmental Protection Agency that's supposed to protect our air and our water is right now run by an energy lobbyist that gives polluters free reign to dump unlimited poison into our air and water. The Labor Department, that's supposed to protect workers and their rights. Right now, it's run by a corporate lobbyist who's declared war on workers guts protections to, to keep essential folks safe during a pandemic makes it easier for big corporations to shortchange them on their wages. The Interior Department, that's supposed to protect our public lands and wild spaces, our, our wildlife and our wilderness. And right now that's run by an oil lobbyist who's determined to sell them to the highest bidder. You've got the Education Department it's supposed to give every kid a chance, and that's run by a billionaire who guts rules designed to protect students from getting ripped off by for-profit colleges and stiff-armed students looking for loan relief in the middle of an economic collapse. I mean, the person who runs Medicaid right now is doing their best to kick people off of Medicaid instead of sign them up for Medicaid. Come on. When Joe and Kamala are in charge, they're not going to surround themselves with hacks and lobbyists, but they're going to appoint qualified public servants who actually care about looking out for you, for your job, for your family, for your health, for your security, for your planet. And that, more than anything, is what separates them from their opponents. They actually care about every American, including the ones that don't agree with them. And they're going to fight for you every day. They care about you, and they care about this democracy. They believe in a democracy. The right to vote is sacred. And that we shouldn't be making people wait in line for 10 hours to cast their ballot. We should be making it easier for everybody to vote. They believe that no one 
especially the president, is above the law. They understand that protest on behalf of social justice isn't un-American. That's the most American thing there is. That's how this country was founded, protesting injustice. They understand we don't threaten our political opponents, threatening to throw them in jail just because we disagree with them. They understand that our ability to work together to solve big problems like a pandemic depends more than on just photo ops. It depends on actually learning the facts and following the science and not just making stuff up whenever it's convenient. We, we, our democracy is not going to work if the people who are supposed to be our leaders lie every day and just make things up. I mean, and we just become numb to it. We just become immune to it every single day. Fact checkers can't keep up. And, and, and look, this, this notion of truthfulness and democracy and, and citizenship and, and being re responsible, these aren't Republican or Democratic principles. They're American principles. They're what, we're, they're what we, most of us grew up learning from our parents and our grandparents. They're, they're not white or black or Latino or Asian values. They're American values, human values. And we need to reclaim them. We have to get those values back at the center of our public life. And we can, but... But to do it, we've got to turn out like never before. We cannot leave any doubt in this election. Because you know, he, the president's already said, if this is even close, I'm going to just make stuff up. He's already started to do it. So we can't have any doubt. We can't be complacent. I don't care about the polls. There were a whole bunch of polls last time. Didn't work out because a whole bunch of folks stayed at home and got lazy and complacent. Not this time, not in this election. Not this time. Listen, listen, I, I understand why a lot of Americans can get frustrated by government and can feel like it doesn't make a difference. Even supporters of mine during my eight years, there were times where stuff we wanted to get done didn't get done. And people said, well, you know, gosh, if, if Obama didn't get it done, then, you know, maybe it's, it's just not going to happen. If, look, government is not going to solve every problem. It's true. Every elected official is going to make some mistakes. This is a big, complicated country. And the system's designed so that change happens slowly. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and believe me, I've got firsthand experience with the way Republicans in Congress abuse the rules to make it easy for special interests to stop progress. But we can make things better. And we, sh we sure shouldn't be making things worse. A president by himself can't solve every challenge in a global economy. But if we've got Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House and a House and Senate that are focused on working people, it can make a difference and get millions of people the help they need. A president by himself can't eliminate all racial bias in our criminal justice system. But if we've got district attorneys and state's attorneys and sheriffs and police chiefs focused on equality and justice, it can make things better. In Pennsylvania, you just got to flip nine seats in your state house, just five seats in your state senate.
and new life for policies that will make a real difference to working families right now, it can make things better. And and it, it, in the end, Pennsylvania, that's what voting's about, making things better. Not making things perfect, but putting us on track so that a generation from now we can look back and say, things got better starting now. And that's what voting's about. Voting's about using the power we have and pooling it together to get a government that's more concerned and more responsive and more focused on you and your lives and your children and your grandchildren and future generations. And the fact that we don't get 100% of what we want right away is not a good reason not to vote. It means we've got to vote and then get some change and then vote some more and then get some more change, and then keep on voting until we get it right. And we will never come close to seeing what it would be like if everybody voted. When I hear people say, well, I, I don't know, your voting doesn't do make a difference. We don't know because usually no more than half the people who could be voting vote. We get 50, 55% of people voting. And then people say, oh, look, you know, not enough change happened. Well, imagine what would happen if 60 percent voted. What about 70 percent? Imagine January 20th when we swear in a president and a vice president who have a plan to get us out of this mess, who believe in science and have a plan to protect this planet for our kids and who care about working Americans and have a plan to help you start getting ahead and who believe in racial equality and gender equality and, and believe in not discriminating against people because of their sexual orientation and are willing to bring us closer to an America where no matter what we look like and where we come from and who we love and what our last name is, if we go out there and we work, we can make it. And we're part of an American family. All of that is possible. All of that is within our reach if we vote. Because let me tell you something, Pennsylvania, some people ask me sometimes, they say, man, how have you been able to take it these last four years just watching all this? How, how, do, you, how do you keep your spirits up? And I, and I tell them, I say, look, for all the times these last four years that we've seen our worst impulses revealed, We've also seen what our country can be at its best. We've seen folks of every age and background who packed city centers and airports and town squares just so families wouldn't be separated. So another classroom wouldn't get shot up. So our kids wouldn't grow up on an uninhabitable planet. We've seen Americans of all races joining together to declare in the face of injustice that black lives matter. No more, but no less, so that no child in this country feels the continuing sting of racism. We've seen folks, our, 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 our essential workers, our healthcare workers, risking their lives day in, day out to save somebody else's loved ones. We've seen people volunteer and contribute to help those who are having an especially difficult time that right now. That's true in Pennsylvania. That's true all across the country. America is a good and decent place. But we've just seen so much noise and nonsense that sometimes it's hard for us to remember. Philadelphia, I'm asking you to remember what this country can be, what it's like when we treat each other with respect and dignity. What it's like when our elected officials actually behave responsibly. I'm asking you to believe in Joe's ability, in Kamala's ability to lead this country out of these dark times and help us build it back better. Because we can't abandon those who are hurting right now. We can't abandon the children who aren't getting the education they need right now. We can't abandon those protesters who inspired us, we've got to channel their activism into action. 
We can't just imagine a better future. We've got to fight for it. We've got to out-hustle the other side. We've got to out-work the other side. We've got to vote like never before and leave no doubt. So make a plan right now for how you're going to get involved and vote. Do it as early as you can. Tell your family, tell your friends how they can vote. Don't stop with Joe and Kamala. Make sure you vote all the way down the ticket. And if we pour all our efforts into these 13 days, if we vote up and down the ticket like never before, then we will not only elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, we will also leave no doubt about what this country that we love stands for. We will not leave any doubt about who we are as a people and the values and ideals that we embrace. What Lincoln called the be better angels of our nature, those are still in us. We see them operating every single day. We see them in neighborhoods. We see them in churches and synagogues and mosques and temples. We see them in people helping out a neighbor. We see them inside our own families. We see that what is best in us is still there. But we've got to give it voice. And we've got to do it now. So let's get to work, people. Let's bring this home. I love you, Philadelphia. Honk if you're fired up. Honk. Honk if you're ready to go. If you're fired up. Are you fired up? Are you ready to go? Yes. Honk. Very honk. <laughs> Are you ready to go? Honking. Let's go make it happen. I love you, Philadelphia. Thank you. Much honk. <laughs> Very loud. Jesus Christ. Low bet. Low bet. Yeah, have we missed that or what? It's like people that hear just like everything else he inherited. <laughs> yeah, he's messed just, it up. <laughs> he's just got he's just got it on ah! he's got it on uh, on lock for sure. Yeah, I just I feel like uh I feel like it's you know, we're all like, oh, we've missed you know he's saying the things Joe should be saying. Well, here's the thing. Barack Obama is yeah, an extraordinary the dude's a unicorn speaker. Man. Like he's there's a reason no Joe could say verbatim what Barack just said, and it wouldn't land the same way, because that's just how special Barack Obama is. Um, Man, yeah, that's good cake. That's good stuff. Yeah, thank you, Lori Bersani. I, I I saw your comment and I got a little choked up there. Someone asked if anything good has come of this. Two things we know exactly: where evil lives, and you guys to teach and journey with. You know, uh, she said this is exactly what we've been doing all this time, and. We we've been we've been becoming aware of that. We, like there's days, there's a lot of days where Corey and I are like, I don't know why we're doing this. What what are we what the fuck? <laughs> but uh yeah. Thank you guys. We're humble. Legit. Yeah. All right. I'm telling you guys, this is gonna blow your fucking minds. Um Yeah, sorry, I was just reading Rika's comment. Yeah, me. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's COVID. People that are talking about that are just. Well, was the last time you remember a Republican running without the former Republican presidents out on the trail for them? Yeah, never. That's not happening. Has that ever happened? <laughs> Um, I just want to make sure that you guys can hear this. Hi, everyone. I'm Brene Brown, and this is Unlocking Us. Good level. We have a special episode for you this week. I am talking to Vice President Joe Biden, the 2020 Democratic presidential nominee. Before we jump into our conversation, I want to share some observations with you about leadership, the nature of power, and why this conversation and the questions I ask are really important to me. I appreciate you being here. So, as some of you know, I've dedicated my entire career to studying the intersection of human behavior, emotion, and thought. I've spent the last 10 years specifically looking at leadership. Here's one thing I know for sure. We cannot understand leadership if we don't talk about power. We have a very strange relationship with the word power. 
We often think of it as negative, as kind of a strong arm experience where we either feel pressure or something's taken away from us. Yet at the exact same time, we kind of push away this notion of power. One of the single worst human experiences for all of us is powerlessness. No one wants to feel powerless. It's a desperate and kind of isolating experience. So we have a really complex relationship with just the term power, not to mention the actual experience of power. The most accurate and important definition of power that I've ever come across in my career in terms of aligning with the data that we've collected, which we have now crossed over 400,000 pieces of data over the last 20 years, the best definition I've seen is from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's a definition that he shared in Memphis, Tennessee, 1968, in a speech he was giving to striking sanitation workers. King defined power as the ability to achieve purpose and affect change. God, simple, powerful, clear. Power is the ability to achieve purpose and affect change. The definition does not make the nature of power inherently good or bad, which again supports the data. What makes power dangerous and what we never talk about is how power is used. I think most of us have not been exposed to the fact that there are four different types of power. And this, I can thank completely my social work education for this, that there is power over. And on the other side of the continuum, there is power with, power to, and power within. Leaders who use power over, and again, this is not just in the political sphere, but this is at work, this is in faith communities, this is in nonprofits, NGOs, people who use power over work from the premise that power is finite and it has to be hoarded and protected. And power over is protected by using fear. Fear is the primary tool for protecting power for those that lead from a place of power over. Leaders who work from a position of power with and power to have a completely different foundational framework. They believe that power becomes infinite and expands when it's shared with others. So there's not a lot of hoarding. There's not a lot of protecting because there's a core fundamental belief that, again, power is expansive when we collaborate and when we share it with others. And I want to go through some of the differences between power over and power with and power to. Because when I got this incredible opportunity to have this conversation with Vice President Biden, I wanted to focus specifically on questions that help me understand his perspective of power. Is it power over? Is it power with, power to, and power within? So let's look at some of the other examples, how we compare and contrast power over and power within two. And, and let me just say, if you're saying, well, you just are looking at the Trump administration and lining up everything they do and then comparing it with this, this, my work on power and the four different kinds of power way predates this administration. I may go back 20 years, 15 years. Same. Same, and it's why we recognize it. Including Dare to Lead. Again, this is not just political. This is about work environments. This is about community environments, faith communities, or any organization where people come together and there's leadership. So with power over, the goal is to leverage fear, to divide, destabilize, and devalue decency as a sign of weakness and for suckers. I mean, really being decent is seen as weakness. And the goal is to divide and destabilize because it's how you maintain power, which you have to do when you believe it's finite. When we talk about power with and power to, shared power, the goal is to leverage connection and empathy to unite and stabilize 
And actually, it's interesting because decency is valued and seen as an actual function of self-respect and respect for others. So a tremendous difference between a goal of destabilizing and dividing, a goal of uniting, and differences around what decency means. Is decency for suckers or is decency a function of self-respect and respect for others? And I know this is kind of a lot to listen to, so I want to tell you that you can go to the show notes on BreneBrown.com and you can get all this information. We're putting it in a downloadable PDF for you. The third is in a model of power over. It's really important to give people who are experiencing fear and uncertainty a false sense of certitude and safety. That is usually based on nostalgia or ideology over facts. Because being right is more important than getting it right. So, I mean, like the last three and a half years of anyone who watches Fox News and when Fox News isn't enough, when it doesn't adhere to this methodology enough, he goes to Breitbart, he goes to OAN, you're still muted. Well, one of the ways to maintain power and power over is when you've got scared people, you give them a sense of certainty, even if it's just based on ideology. With power with and power to, you see a goal of giving people who are in the same amount of fear and uncertainty transparency. There's also, because it's a learning culture, power with and power to and power within is the foundation of a learning culture. It's also critical thinking, evidence-based thinking, and information from multiple perspectives is foundational to power with and power to. Okay, stop. Hang on. Power over. This is why kids from abusive households, from power and control dynamic households, have learning disabilities. It's literally the same thing. Like what she was just talking about, power, power within, power to, power with families are learning environments. Power over are not. Power over households are not. This is, this is scalable right down to to the nuclear family unit up to our entire culture and society. This is, I, I'm, I'm blown away. This is really good stuff. I knew you were going to like this. It's important to give people someone to blame for their discomfort, preferably someone who looks at, and information from multiple perspectives is foundational to power with and power to. Next, with power over, it's important to give people someone to blame for their discomfort. Preferably someone who looks, acts, and sounds different from the majority culture. With power with and power to, way more difficult because we normalize discomfort and there is a wholesale move away from shame and blame toward accountability and meaningful change. Next, when we talk about power over, again, the only way you maintain power over, you may have actually worked in an environment like this or been to school in an environment like this, because this is not just political leadership, it's leadership in general. Power over is maintained by fear. And fear has a very short shelf life. You can't keep us afraid forever. So one way you maintain power over is by demonstrating an ever-increasing capacity for cruelty, including shaming, bullying, belittling, especially toward vulnerable populations. With power with and power to, one of the core principles of power with power to is servant leadership. Leadership is seen as a responsibility to be in service of others rather than served by others. So rather than having to constantly demonstrate more and more cruelty and a greater capacity for bullying and shaming and those things, it's the opposite. I see my job as your leader to serve you and be in service of you rather than served by you. My job is to empower you, not keep the power. The other thing that's interesting, I think that kind of goes along with this, it's a a little bit um, secondary, is with power over, and this is more in political leadership, constructs like personal rights and freedom are used to polarize and being in service of other people is actually seen as weakness. 
where with power with and power to, rights and freedoms go hand in hand with responsibility to country and to citizenry. Or if you're not in a political milieu, if you're in an organization, rights and freedoms are seen going hand in hand with a commitment to the culture, to your colleagues. Last, and this is a really scary part of power over, um, there is a persistent inciting of hatred and violence with dehumanizing language and policies. Dehumanization is at the start line, the foundation of every genocide in recorded human history. And it's that use of language where we take humanity away from people or from groups of people and instill more fear. And it is a very important ingredient in power over. Power with, power to, power within is empathy-driven. The agendas are empathy-driven, policies, values, place human value at the center. And so I wanted to share this lens with you because it's part of my training. And so when I look at leadership and I evaluate leadership, I want to know, are you working from a position of power over, or are you interested in power with, power to, and power within? And power within is about instilling inside of people a sense of agency. I can get things done. I can, in Martin Luther King's words, I can achieve purpose and affect change. And I'm interested in that because Having spent 90% of my time over the last decade inside of organizations from Fortune 50 companies, special forces in the military, faith communities, NGOs all over the world, what I can tell you is transformative leaders, political transformative leaders, corporate leaders, the best coaches. I get to work with a lot of professional sports teams, the best coaches, just the best leaders in general are not interested in power over. They're interested in power with power to and power within. So here's my conversation with Vice President Biden. You'll see the questions that I ask are really about trying to get to the bottom of how does he view power? Mr. Vice President, welcome to Unlocking Us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I always start by asking a very simple question in a complicated time. How are you doing? I'm doing well, but I'm... uh... I'm convinced that the uh, that the public is ready to get up and sort of take back their country and start to cooperate again. I'm starting to get that feeling. So am I. You may recall I was pretty roundly criticized by the a lot of very bright pundits. Talking about unity, when I first started to run, they said, you know, they can't do that. That's the old days. Talking about dealing with bringing people back together again, even in politics and And so that was the old days. But I'm convinced that unless we do it, the only way this democracy can function is with consensus. And I've spent my whole career trying to figure out how to bring people together, not separate them, because otherwise you end up in a a circumstance where it all yields to executive power and abuse of power. It's interesting to me because when we were kind of waiting to see who you were going to pick for your vice president, I got in this conversation with a group of friends and I said, I think it's going to be Senator Harris. And <laughs> the, I did. I, 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 and Good I, they, for you, it, man. no it, wonder I like you. you think <laughs> no, it was, it was interesting <laughs> because my friends just jumped on me and they said, there's no way because she gave him the hardest time during the, during the debates. And I said, but if you look at history, I don't think he's afraid of building coalitions and teams with people who disagree with him. One of the reasons why my Irish heritage has been called into question is because I don't hold grudges. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, the fact is that um, I was convinced that we have to form an administration that looks and represents the American people across the board. And also uh, someone who is ready God forbid, on day one, that they could step up and be the president of the United States. And I think Kamala met all those requirements. So there are some really, really, really incredibly qualified women that are on my list. And I also think it's important to let people know 
that it doesn't do any good when we're trying to bring things together to be so petty about something someone said to you. I mean, I've never let that get in my way of trying to get something done. I mean, if you look back, you really haven't. It's interesting as someone who studies leadership, this is kind of my 10th year in this massive leadership study. And I have come to the belief that teams and coalitions are what drive success. How important to you is team building and coalition building? as you think about your administration? Well, the way I think about it is the way I've thought about it from the time I've been a kid. And I mean that sincerely. Leadership at its core, in my view, is about being personal. It's about being engaged. And it's about trying to put your, always put yourself in the other person's position. And it also to understand where they're coming from, whether it's a major foreign leader or a, a friend who is, you have a disagreement with. And it's also being willing to share credit, give recognition, you know, and share them the benefits as well as in the losses if you're in an endeavor together. And I think the hardest thing for most people is being willing to expose yourself to criticism and ridicule in order to change a damaged culture, whether it's in business or in life. And it's about surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you. They have assets you don't possess. And never, this is the part that I don't know whether you'd agree with me on, but never confusing academic credentials with good judgment. That's right. They don't necessarily go together. And understanding the concept of duty, that realizing, you know, character is based on honesty and avoiding rationalizations. The ability of the human mind to rationalize is overwhelming. And, uh, you know, well, she won't mind if I miss her birthday because, or he won't mind if I don't get home in time for the graduation, but I have a great opportunity. No, I mean, it's just rationalization is a default for so many people. I think when my dad used to say, he said, character, Joe, is built on a thousand little things and it demonstrates your integrity. It's no one thing. It's a thousand things. He used to say that, you know, you got to be a man or woman of your word. And without that, you don't possess much. So, I mean, it's all those basic, basic, basic things, it seems to me. God, that makes so much sense. In our research, we call those marble jar moments, that trust is not a sweeping moment. It's just a collection of small marbles over time. But it really is. Think about the people you genuinely trust. Yeah. Think about the people you know. I've had the privilege of knowing nearly every major world leader in the last 44 years, not because I'm so important, but because I chaired the Foreign Relations Committee for years. I was also a member of the Intelligence Committee all that time, as vice president. My primary job was to interface with foreign leaders. I guess maybe the way to put it from my perspective is realizing that there's something bigger than just yourself. Mm. Being willing to take risks for the enterprise, whether it's your family, whether it's your business, whether it's your government, whether it's whatever it is. I mean, (laughs) it's about not being petty. You're speaking my language now, Mr. Vice President. You're talking about vulnerability and empathy. And I don't know that you can lead courageously without empathy and vulnerability. Do you think you can? No, I don't think you can. Yes, The leaders that I've admired um, over my career have been people who have demonstrated both of them. We all have our weaknesses. But not being able to understand where the other woman is coming from, where the other man is coming from, without understanding what pain is, without understanding Mm. what people are going through. I mean, people always talk about the things that have happened in my life and so on and so forth. And and that, But, you know, so many people have gone through what I've gone through without any of the kind of help I've had, without any of the foundation. My mom used to have an expression. She'd say, Joey, bravery resides in every heart and someday it will be summoned. Someday it will be summoned. For real. I mean, my mom was really, really, really... She had a backbone like a ramrod. She was really a, uh, just had so much character as my dad did. She say, you know, the greatest of all virtues is courage because mm. without it, you couldn't love with abandon. God. I mean, for real, this, this is, yeah. these are things like when I was a kid, I used to stutter pretty badly. And uh, my mother would grab me by the lapels and look at me and say, Joey, look at me, look at me, Joey. Remember. You're Biden. Nobody is better than you, Joey, but you're no better than anybody else, Joey. God. No, I I really mean it. Give me my word. So powerful. Give me my word. And my dad's expression was that you have to, everybody, everybody's entitled to be be treated with dignity. If you got in a fight when you were a kid in my house and someone did something really mean to you, uh, you know, said something ugly to you, 
you could never say back to them something about them that they could not control, that was beyond their capacity. You could say you're a jerk. You could say you're this, but you could never say anything that was true because it went to the quick of who the person was. Mm. And it's not something they can control. It's not it's shaming. Yeah, yeah no, it's so it's shaming. Not, by the way, it is. But think of how it works most times. Yeah, we see it every day. I mean, what do you think your parents would have thought about where we are right now and how shaming and just unkind people are? My dad would have been just absolutely disgusted. Uh, and my mom thought that it was really important to stay engaged. It was always about something bigger than you. It's like mm. when I wrote the book about my son, it was really hard to write about my son, Bo, passed I bet, away. Yeah. Because I wanted people to know who he was. And not I didn't want anybody feeling sorry for us because said a lot of people go through that and worse and don't have the kind of support I had. But I remember him telling our doctor, as he's going into his last operation, doctor, promise me, if I pass away, it's okay. If I pass away, take care of my dad, doctor. Take care of my mm -hmm. dad. And wow. that's kind of how we were all kind of taught. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. A lot of love and empathy. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's those little, those thousand little acts of kindness that can change where we are now. When everybody tells me, how do we unify the country? I said, well, start off by thinking how you treat other people. You know, when there's a, a snowstorm and the, and the older lady lives next door to you, she can't afford to shovel her sidewalk, go shovel the sidewalk. Go shovel the sidewalk. It's no big deal. Just little tiny things that bring people together, that make people realize, whoa, I guess I matter. I guess I care. Or, you know, when the, I always say to people, when they say, we'll never be able to pull things together. And I point out to them, I said, when's the last time you thanked somebody? When, when's the last time when you went to the supermarket and you had to get something back in the, in the stock room, someone went back and you said, really, thank you so much for doing that for me. Yeah, and looked them in the eye when you said it. Exactly right. I, I really mean it. I mean, think about it. I know. We all want to be valued for what we do. And be seen and respected. Yeah. Exactly right. Anyways, I'm going on to I apologize. <laughs> no, you're you're right. Are you kidding? You have slid right into my wheelhouse. <laughs> my sister's a gigantic fan of yours, by the way. My sister Valerie. She's smarter oh, she than is? I am. She's better looking. But she's been <laughs> on my handlebars and my bike since she's been three years old. She's my best friend in the world. But uh, she's a big fan of yours. Well, I got to tell you, like, I am a big believer. One of the tenets of my work around Dare to Lead is who you are is how you lead. Mm -hmm. And we can lead from heart or we can lead from hurt. And when we lead from heart and believe, I think, that our job is to serve people, not be served by people, I think it makes a difference. I think it makes a gigantic look. I always say some version of that, and my colleagues, anybody listening to this, or <laughs> they've heard me say it a hundred times. The people I trust the most in public life who have an idea is an idea that is generated in their gut, goes to their heart, and they have the intellectual capacity to articulate it. Mm. They're the people. The people intellectually arrive at it without the feeling, but intellectually know this is the right thing to do. They're good people, but they're the ones that crack when pressure breaks when pressure yeah. really builds. But the people who it starts in their gut, they're the people that you can that you can count on. And look, the coin of the realm still, no matter how bad the politics has gotten in public life and putting the coalitions together, is still your word, keeping your word. My staff used to say, when I talk so-and-so into voting for this particular item on the floor of the Senate, and I tell them, I need your vote on this, this is what it will do. And But by the way, you should know, if you vote for it, you're going to get clobbered by this element of your party. They say, why'd you tell him that? Why'd you tell him that? I told him that because he knows I'm going to be completely, thoroughly honest with him. I'm never going to mislead him. And I think it matters. Oh, God, I was just going to say that. I think that matters. So this is, this is a good segue. I want, to, I want to talk to you about the pandemic, about COVID. Yes. How we are so tired and weary and we're heading into flu season and for some reason that's absolutely mind-boggling to me 
we have politicized science and almost demonized it. Tell me what your vision and plan is for moving us through this. You're dead right about the demonization of science. I usually, in my speeches these days when I'm out, is saying, you know, what I choose. And I choose science over fiction. If you take a look at it, the people who are choosing to ignore the science tend to be people who believe they have the wherewithal to avoid the impacts of the downside of what happens by not pushing the scientific side. For example, one of the things that's changing is no matter how much money you have, you can't build a wall high enough around your estate to keep it from you being affected by climate change. You just can't that's do right. it. That's right. No matter how you, you can, in fact, attempt to isolate yourself from disease with a little more efficiency, but not very much. You can't avoid what's happening. And people continue to think that that they can. I mean, one of the things that I think that changed around, uh, I don't know, I'd say the early 2000s was that we went into this whole notion of devolution of government. And the, the devolution of government was all about not wanting to pay taxes thinking you could do it, you had the wherewithal to take care of yourself. For example, they want all the decisions made locally. That sounds like they really support local control, right? Except that when you have a lot of money, you have a lot of influence, you have a lot of power, you're much more easily able to sway a city council or a state legislative body than you are the entire United States Congress representing 50 different points of view based on geography you're much less likely to be able to make your weight, in fact, bring brought to bear because you have countervailing forces in the national. That's right. And so what happened was we got into this whole thing about why, I mean, did you ever think you'd see a day, I, I don't want to get into policy, I apologize, but think a day where Republicans were against infrastructure? It used to be Republicans were the ones who wanted to build highways, roads, ports, bridges, airports, attract business, and so on. Why have they not supported anything in the last about 10 years? Why? Well, guess what? It means if it's done at a national level, they're going to have to pay taxes. They're going to have to pay more taxes. And they don't want any part of that, even though they're the ones that benefit when people put their businesses where they can get their products to market the quickest. But they don't want to pay for that because they think somehow they can take care of it and not have to support the national agenda. And the other thing I'm finding is that how we become awfully regional, and it's Democrats and Republicans, we're a federal system. And the federal system says that we make up for each other's shortcomings and what we lack. So I remember having a debate once when they wanted to get rid of Amtrak. And they say, why should I pay for, this is a Westerner, why should my mother pay for taxes to make sure that people can commute in New York City or up and on down the East Coast? Why? I said, I'll send an amendment to the desk. And the amendment said, let's totally defund Amtrak and totally defund all water projects. And all of a sudden, there was silence. Yeah. I said, why should my mom pay? You ever fly across the country and you see all those great big cisterns that are in the West, in the desert, to provide water for the states that don't have it? That we build the entire country paid for the Hoover Dam. The entire country. Why should we do that? That's about thinking only about yourself. And it's got to change back. It wasn't That's not how we built the country. I'm sorry, I'm getting into too much of policy. No, it's important to talk about it. When I've seen these regional fights, even around COVID, and I've seen these yeah. fights with, you know, I'm in Houston. I told my husband, who's a pediatrician, I'm like, we're going to die and our death certificate is going to say death by rugged individualism. It's like, yep. there is like this mythology that we don't need each other when neurobiologically, We're hardwired to be together. Bingo. And the other piece of this is, look, the whole reason, in my view, why the appeal is being made as it is, that you're being a tough guy by not wearing a mask and da-da-da, is all about wanting to irresponsibly open when you shouldn't be opening certain things so the stock market doesn't take a hit. 
I'm not joking now. I, I mean this sincerely. No, I agree. I, I believe you and I agree. And what you do, you go out to get the guys that I grew up with and say, are you a tough man? You don't need a mask, man. Are you tough? And these guys come out and say, it's freedom. 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 If you want to be a patriot, the mask you're putting on is not to protect you. It's to protect the other guy. It's a patriotic thing to do. It's not it about is. you. It's about being patriotic. It's about helping the other guy, the other woman. Anyway, I, I just think if you notice, everything of late has not been about addition, but about division. I think it's really, it's important. It's an interesting segue to the next thing I'd love to get your thoughts on, which is I'm a fifth generation Texan. And as I look at the world right now, one of the things that as a researcher that's emerged from my research is this idea that if we run from a hard story in our lives, or if we run from a hard history, when we run those histories and those stories own us. So we have to have the courage to turn and face the story and the history. Absolutely. Right. And so what's interesting to me is how are we going to, in your mind, turn toward a history of enslavement and dehumanization with the black community, where will we find the courage to turn toward that and own it so we can write a different ending? Well, this is really, 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 I think, necessary but complicated. Look, I got involved in public life as a kid because of civil rights. Not a joke. I was no, I'm not making myself be some great star. But we moved down from Scranton, Pennsylvania when dad lost work and down to a little town called Claymont, Delaware. It's a little steel town. My dad was a salesperson. And th there were very few African-Americans in Northeast Pennsylvania. But moving down to Delaware, we had the eighth highest percentage of African-Americans as a population in the whole country. In Delaware. And so I remember mom used to drive us up with, used to be the Philadelphia Pike, which everybody in the East Coast knows about I-95. It's been replaced by I-95, but it's still there. It was a four-lane access highway that was too dangerous to walk the uh, essentially probably, I don't know, I'm thinking probably half mile, which we could do up from the, the apartments we lived in to go to the school I went to. And so my mom used to drive us up in the morning because he didn't want us crossing the street there. And I remember getting out of the car one day and saying, Mom, why are all those African-American kids in that bus that goes by every day, by the school? I happened to be going to a parochial school at the time, grade school. And she said, because they're not allowed to go to the public school. And I thought to myself, wow, how come that could be? How could that be? And it was just this whole notion that, my dad's notion, everybody, Joey, everybody, is entitled to be treated with respect and dignity, everybody. And I just, it didn't calculate it all. But what's happened is that I think an awful lot has moved in the direction of the American people seeing, they've had the blinders taken off and seen in the middle of a crisis that we've had, the, the quadruple crises we're facing, and people have all of a sudden realized, wow. And I think what's happened is when I was a kid, I guess I was... 15 years old, thereabouts, and uh, uh, Bull Connor and his dogs, and we, they were singing them on those ladies in black going to church and mm -hmm. fire hoses on kids, their skin getting ripped off. And it was a black and white TV, but I remember That's what happened Selma. was in all those Selma. states where there were no African Americans, they'd heard about all that was going on. They didn't believe it till they saw it. And it was like a wake up call. Dr. King called it the second emancipation. We got out of that, what we saw, what everybody saw nationally on that. We got the Civil Rights Act. We got the Voting Rights Act. He called the second emancipation. Well, look what happened with George Floyd. People saw a man callously with one hand in his pocket, have a knee on a man whose nose is being crushed against the curb, saying, I can't breathe, and asking for his mama, and staying there for eight minutes and 46 seconds till he died. Well, all those cell phones all over America, guess what? People saw it, and they didn't really believe that really happened. That's not who most cops are, but there are enough bad cops out there that that happens. And all of a sudden, people, not only did they march in the United States, they marched in Europe, all over the world. 
And so I think there's sort of a liberation in exposure. Or, for example, I think we should have to learn about what happened in, in Oklahoma, where you had Black Wall Street burned to the ground. And so I think it's important we teach history not in a prescriptive way, from my perspective, but what actually the facts were, without also acknowledging that there's 400 years of racism in the United States of America. That's what it is. And it's able to be fixed. And I think most people are beginning to step up to it. People fear what's different. But when you start to tell people, whoa, wow, I didn't know that. He did that. And I just think that it's exposure. And we shouldn't be afraid of it. And this president is trying to, what's he have? He called the 1776 Project or something he has. I don't think he understands what happened in 1776. America was an idea, an idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We've never lived up to it, but we've never walked away from it before. And I just think we have to be more honest and let our kids know as we raise them what actually did happen acknowledge our mistakes so we don't repeat them. God, this idea of, I, I've never really heard it framed this way, that exposure is liberation. By the way, I think it is because most people, look, I still, I refuse to believe. I always ask them why I'm an optimist in light of my life. Well, I'm an optimist because I think that human nature, given an even shot, they tend to do the right thing. But what happens is when they don't know what's going on, they fear. I remember I went on Meet the Press and I told the President Obama that if I got asked about, about homosexuality and gay marriage, I was going to say something, but I wouldn't go out and push it because where there was this inv- evolving going on. And I knew where the President was, where I was. But I got asked on Meet the Press what I think about same sex marriage. And I said, I told the story about my dad. I remember my dad dropping me off at the city hall to go in and get an application to be a lifeguard on the east side of Wilmington in what we used to call the projects in a 95% African-American neighborhood, which was uh, had about a 1,000 kids a day come to a public swimming pool. And as I was getting out of the car at the corner, we call Rodney Square, where there used to be big corporate centers. It was, you know, Hercules Corporation and and the DuPont company and others. And I saw these two men dressed in suits lean up and hug each other and kiss each other and go a different direction. I looked, just turned and looked at my dad. I hadn't seen that before. He said, Joey, it's simple. They love each other. It's simple. Wasn't complicated. And the point of the matter is that when I came out and said I supported marriage, including men and men, and women and women, everybody went nuts. But I made a bet. The American people were way ahead of everybody. The poll was taken showing that at that moment, 56% of the American people already had arrived at that position. Because all of a sudden, people are figuring out, God, I didn't know my uncle was gay. I didn't know my Aunt Mary was. I didn't know Sally. You know, they're just like me. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think that the American public are ahead of their political leadership. And the political leadership tends to be timid and afraid to do things that they know in their gut we should be doing when the American people, by and large, have already moved there. It's so interesting. One of the things I say a lot in my work is that people are really hard to hate close up. That's exactly right, by the way. That's exactly right. You look into my heart, you look into my eyes, and you can see. I mean, you see yourself many times. Of course. Now, some people are not like that. That's why, I mean, everybody talks about bullies, you know, well... I'm used to bullies. When you're a kid who stutters, I'm now, you know, I'm 6'1", I'm 176 pounds. But when I was a kid, I didn't grow till my middle of my sophomore year to my junior year. I was the run of the litter. And, uh, you know, I'm used to dealing with people that make fun of me. But what I also learned was that the fact is that most bullies are incredibly insecure. Oh, yeah. Incredibly insecure. And I think that that's why we have to understand that we can't be intimidated by these guys and women sometimes. Yeah, because I think their fear can be contagious. Um, (laughs) And right, and (laughs) yeah, their fear is contagious. And I think they are, bullies can be very good at leveraging fear. And one of the things that 
I really love about the broad coalitions of people who agree and disagree and have different ex- life experiences really is this idea of yours that exposure is liberation to see me and know me and see that I just wake up and pack lunches and drive carpool and try to get to work on time just like you. Um, there's there's a lot of connection in that, I think. Well, I do too. I And, and I, I really do. And technology has given us a much wider aperture on the world, but made us much more insular. Oh, God, that's so counterintuitive and dangerous and true. Well, you know, it's like I have wonderful grandkids and great son and daughter who are alive. And and when you ever hear them say that, well, you know, my friend got a phone call saying Mm -hmm. from her boyfriend or girlfriend, we're breaking up. It's hell a lot easier to do it on the phone than it is, yeah. you know, on, on Zoom or, I mean, on uh, on your cell phone than it is to look somebody in the eye and do it. And it's there's a lot of depersonalization yeah. with the exposure. So I think that's going to be one of the hardest things that as a society, as a world, we're going to have to come to grips with. We know a hell of a lot more about what's going on inside of uh, Putin's Russia, but we also find ourselves in a position where it's almost impersonal what's happening to people because we are used to distancing ourselves to avoid the crises that we face. Yeah, it takes courage to show up and connect with people because it's, you know, yeah. I often say that the uh, brokenhearted are the bravest among us because they have the courage to love. And so I think when we put ourselves out there and love and connect and be vulnerable. You're my sister's days, but you sound like my mom. Remember I told you she said <laughs> courage? Is the, is the greatest of all virtues because without it, you couldn't love unconditionally. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I think I would have liked your mom for sure. Oh, you would have liked my mom. You would have liked, she went, what a thing. I was one of those guys that had a mom that not, not a joke. Everybody wish had been their mom for real. Yeah. Okay. I've got three rapid fire questions for you. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. A snapshot of an ordinary moment in your life that really brings you joy. Just a simple picture. Watching my son and daughter, when they see each other, embrace one another and kiss. Mm. Oh, okay. Favorite meal? <laughs> but I was smart enough to marry Dominic Giacoppa's daughter. Italian <laughs> food, spaghetti. What are you eating with your, is it spaghetti with like bolognese sauce? Spaghetti with uh, a ribiati sauce and mm. uh, a ribiati and uh, a little bit of, a little bit of uh, chicken parmesan. With a caprese salad. <laughs> oh my God, that sounds good. Okay, last one. What's on your nightstand? Well, the picture on my nightstand is a picture of my two boys, Bo and Hunt, when they were uh, seven and eight years old, maybe eight and nine years old, holding their sister who just came home from the hospital mm. and just was born, Ashley. It's on my nightstand along with a picture of my mom and dad. When they were younger. Mr. Vice President, I am so grateful for the time you've spent with us. Thank you for sharing your vision. Thank you. I, I, it's been an honor. And I, I really think that what you're talking about, not being afraid to open up and know one another. And by the way, nobody, nobody, nobody can stop us. But one thing you got to know, also in my book, I've just been rereading, and that is by Jonathan Alter, The First Hundred Days of Roosevelt. There's no such thing as a, as a guaranteed democracy. That's right. It has to be fought for every time. If you read the first, just the first chapter, talk about how guys like Walter Lippmann were telling Roosevelt, we have to have a dictatorship to get it right, about how things, there's nothing automatic about this. We got to earn it every single generation. And the, mm-hmm. I used to hear that all the time and think that's not true. I mean, it's just, we, we have it permanently. No, you see what's happening now. I think we're living in the evidence that it is not only a fight that we have to stay in, but it's a fight worth fighting. Yeah, and it's worth fighting because it uh, sounds melodramatic, but our future and our democracy depends on it. And by the way, I'm not making myself out to be some kind of savior. I don't mean it that way. I just, the institutions matter. The only way we can get things done, when people say you can't unify the country, Joe, well, let me tell you something. Uh, if we can't, we're in real trouble because the only way in a democracy you can get things done is with consensus. You don't have to change principle, but you have to at least listen to the other person's position. Compromise has become a dirty word. It's not. It's not. No, it's courage. 
Yep, you got it. You know, last question, last point. Every time yeah. I'd walk out of my grandpa Finnegan's house up in Scranton for real, he'd yell, Joey, keep the faith. My grandmother, when she was alive, she'd yell out, no, Joey, spread it. Go spread oh the faith, God. kid. Keep it going. <laughs> no, for real. So go go get them, kid. There's so many women you, you're inspiring. And as an old expression goes, it's a women hold up half the sky. I love that. I do love that. We cannot, we cannot survive if women in our society aren't fully, thoroughly, totally integrated into everything we do. I mean, for real. Well, anyway, I hope I get to meet you someday. And I hope if the uh, occasion permits you to allow me to come back on your show one day. I would love it. Thank you. Thanks Thank for being you. with us. Okay, All take right. care. Bye-bye. I mean, that was remarkable, right? Uh, yeah, I, I did not get a chance to listen to it when you and Kelly were, were discussing it the other day, but that's, that's a lot of what he talked about is what I teach men about being better, better human beings. You know, it, I boil it down to two kinds of power, but I, I really like her explanation better. Um, you know, there's power that you have because you took it away from others or there's power that you have within yourself to help yourself and others do better. So that's power within is how we always boil that down. But yeah, the power with and power to, man, imagine how much power you could be giving your partner, your your child, uh, your country, if you yeah. chose to use your power for something other than taking it away from others. Exactly. Uh, that was really remarkable. I, I tell you what, if I'd have heard that 10 months ago, he might have been my first choice. I, honestly, I, th- I had I think, never. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, it, it just, and I commented a, a, a little bit above, like it just hearing this for me, all of the people that were, were raving about him and I didn't get it. I get it now. Like, yeah. cause this, you, you don't fake that for uh, an K- hour. To be fair, Casey Marion has well, told us all the whole, along the whole that time. Joe Biden was our first choice. I tried arguing with Casey Marion once it was <laughs> dumb and I lost <laughs> and I won't ever do it again. Like there, there are very few people who will, when I, you know, argue with them, go get data, all of the data and then go, Hey, you like that? And I'm like, yep. And you're committed to change your mind with that. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And then she just drives from Indiana or wherever she's from with a dump truck full of fucking data and drops it off in my lap. It's here. Yeah. You want this? And I'm like, no more, please. <laughs> anyway, I got to read this Kevin, uh, uh, Kevin Grace's comment here in full because it really speaks to it. Like, and we've seen, uh, I think probably all of us have, have an example of this, but in regards to what she said about people needing someone, something to blame for their discomfort, there are people in my family who were lifelong Democrats, liberals left who turned Trump supporter overnight. And they suddenly felt the need to blame the left for everything. I watched them become fascinated with right wing propaganda and they fell for the fear mongering. It kills me to think it's as simple as that. They just want to go back to the days when marginalized people didn't have outlets. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's fucked up. <laughs> yeah. I, I, up. I also like, I, I also like Kevin's uh, follow up comment, which was between Obama talking about his first job and Biden's favorite meal, I'm going to order spaghetti, chicken parm, and basket robins <laughs> to eat during the debate. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> ah, technology stuff. is the best. All right. So we're going to break this and, uh, and start a new stream for the debate. Is that what we're planning to do? Uh yeah yeah we'll take uh, we'll take five minutes and we'll uh, we'll start back up I gotta go he me, he means a pee back. break yeah no I I just need ice for my back now I suddenly need to pee because somebody was talking <laughs> about it so that's a whole that's all right you guys thing. we'll be back shortly with uh with with peanut butter cups and, <laughs> yeah. uh, hold on hold on we just just gotta let that sit there for <laughs> just, just carry on but the show is gonna last about another thirty seconds nothing to yeah. see here that's all fine. Just wanted to throw that, throw that up there. <laughs> yeah, we knew you would. I mean, because we know, because we know, we know you're not an asshole, despite your best efforts to come off as one. Does try, <laughs> but it's it's yeah. It, anyway, um, with as much affection as I can possibly muster. Not kidding. Fuck you too. Uh, so anyway, yeah. All right, so we're uh, we're back in a few minutes. Yep, I'm gonna uh, get a new link up, and so we'll we'll turf this. We'll be back in about five minutes. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. Sasquatch is real.